Hi, my name is uh, Dan Knorr. I'm a temporary assistant professor in the history faculty uh, and I teach on modern Asian history. Uh, my specialty is in the history of China, uh, including the Qing Dynasty, which is I'm going to talk a little bit about. Uh, according to you know, uh, historian Walter Scheidel, uh, by his estimation, no empire in world history has ruled over a greater proportion of the population of the world at any given time as the Qing Dynasty did. Approaching 40% of the world's population was ruled by the Qing in the year 1800. And so the sheer size of this empire, as well as its duration around 250 years alone, uh, makes it something fairly important and worthwhile to study, I think. Um, but I'd also argue that studying the Qing Dynasty is also uh, important for understanding the present day, particularly because of its influence on later Chinese history uh, in terms of setting the borders of what we think of China today through territorial expansion and the incorporation of conquest uh, of diverse ethnic groups. Um, and also the Qing is important as a case study uh, for uh, successful and adaptive political formation, uh, but also one that over time ran into a series of challenges, uh, and challenges that ultimately uh, proved insurmountable uh, to it. And that's uh, an important thing for us, I think, to be studying at this current moment in history. So the Qing is best known as the last dynastic monarchy to rule over China, and it did so from the year 1644 to 1912. In fact, though, the Qing rulers weren't Chinese, but rather Manchus. They were a distinct ethnicity with their own language and different sorts of cultural practices. The Manchus were an ethnic group that came from the far eastern portion of the Great Eurasian Steppe, north of what was at that time the Ming Dynasty ruling China. The Manchu state consolidated its power and began to expand uh, from the late 16th and early 17th century. Then in 1644, when a rebel uprising toppled the Ming Dynasty, they took advantage of the opportunity to invade China uh, and ultimately were able to conquer the entirety of it and rule it, as I said, for another 250 years or so. The Qing were especially famous for their uh, banner soldiers. Uh, the banners were these hereditary social military uh, units that provided the basis for the kind of elite crack troops of the Qing dynasty. Uh, Qing troops were, like other uh, soldiers from the steppes, especially adept at archery and horseback riding. After the conquest, the Qing also employed bannermen, which included Manchus as well as Mongolians, and also some Chinese who uh, were brought into the banner system as administrators, and especially in key powerful positions um, in their uh, rule over the empire. However, the Qing also depended to a great deal on the participation and cooperation of Chinese actors. This included in military roles, even from uh, the conquest of China itself. Even some uh, officers and soldiers who had fought for the Ming uh, wound up fighting for the Qing as they proceeded in the conquest, uh, since rebels had already toppled the Ming dynasty by the time the Qing uh, started the conquest. Uh, and then, on an even larger scale, after the Qing conquest of China, they relied to a, a great extent on uh, Chinese uh, elites to help them administer this you know, sprawling and you know, world historically large uh, empire in terms of land area uh, and number of people. So they employed uh, Chinese elites in uh, a wide range of administrative positions, and these elites also had important roles to play within their local communities and non-governmental capacities, helping with things like public works projects, uh, as well as tax collection and, and whatnot. So as that situation suggests then, one of the key reasons for Qing's success, at least the, the durability and length of its reign, um, was their adaptivity and their ability to incorporate a diverse range of actors into the you know, creation and administration of their empire. For example, uh, the Qing adopted the Chinese structure of administration um, that had been effectively in place uh, at the end of the Ming Dynasty uh, and employed then Chinese actors in filling those roles. They also uh, 
took on ideological aspects of you know, Chinese forms of rulership, where the Qing emperor uh, played the role of the son of heaven, uh, who had uh, a moral and uh, political responsibility, uh, both to the subjects of his empire, but also to the cosmos as a whole. That isn't to say, though, that the Qing entirely gave up Manchu practices, far from it. In fact, kind of retaining um, some key Manchu elements were also an important part of Qing's success. This included, for example, the banner system, which uh, effectively made uh, this conquest elite uh, of Manchus, Mongolians, and a relatively small number of Chinese, uh, basically kept them distinct uh, from the vast majority of the population. Likewise, while the uh, Qing emperors appeal to this Chinese ideology of imperial rulership, they also developed a pluralistic ruling ideology, so that they ruled different sets of people uh, in ways that were legible to them. So to the Chinese, the Qing emperor was a son of heaven. To the Mongols, he was a great Khan. To the Tibetans, he was a Kakravartan wheel-turning king, and so on. And so to different groups, the Qing emperor could play effectively you know, different sorts of roles in order to make them uh, feel like part of the empire on their terms, more or less. We can see this dynamic between the distinctiveness and pluralism of the Manchus and you know, Chinese cooperation in the empire uh, in the expansion of the Qing in various frontier regions. Uh, one uh, of these regions was the southwest uh, part of China, where the Qing encouraged Chinese settlement at the expense of indigenous peoples. Um, doing so helped uh, ease population pressure in the highly populated and productive uh, eastern parts of China uh, by opening up, from the Qing perspective, more land for Chinese settlers, which then provided a stable tax base for the empire. So it was a win-win sort of situation. So both increasing tax revenues, uh, but also giving uh, the government and the Chinese uh, settlers a more direct access to natural resources like copper, which was needed for minting coins, as well as timber, which was increased in increasingly short supply uh, in eastern parts of China. This uh, process of settlement uh, in the Southwest took advantage of uh, crops from the Americas that were now available because of ongoing uh, trade via Europeans. These included maize and sweet potatoes, and these facilitated Chinese agricultural settlement uh, of upland regions where existing practices of, of rice agriculture uh, weren't as effective. And so there's this very cooperative relationship between um, Qing rule and Chinese settlement and expansion into the southwest. There's a somewhat different arrangement in the northwest uh, where the Qing expand militarily uh, over the course of the late 17th and even more into the 18th century. There the primary concerns driving Qing expansion were security concerns. Um, the threat to the Qing was the rise of a Mongol state called the Tsongars um, that threatened kind of an emerging bipolar uh, system between the Qing and the Russians who had negotiated a border treaty in the late 17th century. Um, and so the, the Qing at first tried to get the Tsongars to uh, submit uh, to, to, to their um, uh, overlordship effectively uh, using diplomacy and also offering trading privileges. Um, however, from the Qing perspective, after repeated rebellions of the Tsongars who wanted to create a state uh, for themselves, uh, autonomous uh, of the Qing, the Qing, in response to this, uh, increasingly adopted you know, militaristic policy, and this culminated in the conquest of um, what is geographically called Turkestan, what's today known as Xinjiang, uh, in 1755, uh, and after which the, the Qing exterminated um, many of the Dzungar men, uh, kind of early incidents, we might say, of a form of, of genocide. And the Qing named this region Xinjiang, or no borderlands. Um, as this kind of new part of their empire. Initially, the, the, the Chinese had a fairly limited role to play uh, in Qing expansion uh, into Xinjiang. Um, they, Chinese merchants did play uh, an important role in shipping grain out to this region that was very far from the most productive agrarian regions, and that's one of the things that made the conquest very difficult for the Qing was the logistical challenge of shipping grain and other goods into the interior. And so the Qing government relied on Chinese merchants um, with already highly developed uh, supply networks to help them uh, accomplish this. 
Um, but in terms of uh, administration, uh, Chinese elites didn't play the same sort of role that they did within China proper. Um, instead, it was more kind of Manchu and Mongolian bannermen who oversaw um, the you know, local administration and governance of the people who lived in Xinjiang, which included a large number of Turkic Muslims we know as Uyghurs. However, that situation did wind up changing in the 19th century uh, as more and more Chinese elites became increasingly aware of uh, Xinjiang um, and began to see it, uh, its land as a resource that could be exploited for, among other things, uh, agrarian settlement and encouraged uh, more and more migration into the region uh, and then fought very hard to reintegrate it into the empire after a major rebellion in the 19th century. Speaking of the 19th century, this kind of gets us into the history of the eventual fall of the Qing dynasty. The, the Qing faced a, a great variety of challenges uh, over the course of the 19th century. On the one hand, they faced difficulties in disciplining uh, existing government institutions, preventing corruption, uh, could, uh, preserving the power of the emperor to intervene personally in the political process while also allowing for a degree of you know, bureaucratic regularity. By the turn of the 19th century, um, the Qing Empire economically was running into the kind of ecological limits of its highly productive agrarian system. And so you see increasing incidents of things like floods. And uh, then when there are floods or droughts or other uh, so-called natural disasters because of the high uh, population density of uh, large parts of the uh, empire, um, the humanitarian effects of those disasters were particularly acute and many people could die uh, as a result of even relatively short-term uh, downturns in agrarian production. Partly in response to these economic problems, the Qing also faced a large number of uh, internal uprisings over the course of the 19th century. The most destructive of these was undoubtedly uh, the Taiping Rebellion in the 1850s and 1860s. And this um, rebellion effectively turned uh, what was one of the most economically productive parts of China, the kind of central and eastern portion of the country, into a mass battleground uh, for over a decade, resulting in the deaths of 20, maybe 30 million people. So it's a highly destructive war and only one uh, among several. Over the course of the century, the Qing also faced uh, a variety of foreign threats. Perhaps you've heard of the British Opium War, um, where it's fought over the efforts of British merchants to import uh, opium uh, into China. Um, and this succession of conflicts have a variety of consequences for the Qing. Um, on, on the one hand, as you see in the Opium War, the Qing loses the ability to regulate uh, foreign trade, which means that goods are being imported against the desires of the government, um, and it doesn't have autonomy in setting tariffs, um, both to increase its own revenues uh, and also to support the development of domestic industries. Um, the Qing also make territorial concessions uh, to foreign powers, like the island of Taiwan, which the Qing had conquered in the late 17th century, uh, but was forced to cede to Japan uh, in 1895. And then, as a result of these conflicts, the Qing had to pay a series of very heavy indemnities to uh, foreign countries. Um, and these wound up constraining the ability of the Qing to undertake the reforms that a uh, vast you know, variety of actors were increasingly realizing were necessary in order to preserve the empire. The accumulated effects of these crises um, really came to a head then in the early 20th century and culminated in the 1911 revolution, where a combination of efforts by revolutionaries to topple this Manchu Qing government, they thought that you know, the Qing, that China should be ruled by Chinese people, not by Manchus, um, along with disillusionment on the part of Chinese elites who weren't necessarily initially on the side of revolution but thought reforms were necessary, um, but at some point they became disillusioned with the pace and the effectiveness of those reforms, uh, and so in response to an uprising within the military, decided to, to go in with the revolutionaries, and this brought about uh, the negotiated but so bloody fall of the Qing in 1911 and 1912 after which um, China was ruled by a, a republic, albeit a very fragile one. So the Qing 
today our history, but that history still matters. As I said, the Qing were a key part of expanding the borders of what we think about as China, and not just extending their rule, but also drawing Chinese elites into participating in the administration of that empire and producing knowledge about it. And so eventually those Chinese elites came to think of these territories in the southwest and Xinjiang and Taiwan as part of what should constitute China. And in many ways we can draw continuities from that to today. If you look at how we teach about the Qing in various ways at Cambridge, you can also get a sense of the potential significance of that history. For example, in our first year outline paper on 20th century world history, I've given two lectures on the fall of the Qing in 1911. Uh, as thinking about this event in Chinese history from the perspective of world history and how it relates to themes of growing global interconnection, the deployment of steam technologies in the forms of steamship and railroads, um, and how despite this you know, greater global integration, there are also destabilizing effects of that, both do uh, domestically, as we see in China, but also internationally, as we see the growth of inter-imperial competition uh, proceeding alongside and through this process of global integration, and ultimately that culminates uh, in uh, a major global conflict, the First World War uh, in 1914. Uh, from next year, I'll also be teaching uh, one of our first year sources class um, that will focus on the theme of globalization in 19th century China. So we'll be using different kinds of primary sources to look at the variety of different sorts of actors who participated in this thing that we call globalization. We have missionaries, diplomats, intellectuals, various different sorts of people who participate in different ways uh, in this process. And one of the things that we'll be wrestling with there is that in 19th century China, it's very clear that globalization and imperialism go hand in hand very much. And so rather than a simple flattening of the world, we see the construction of different sorts of power relations there. And so we'll explore um, how that's you know, constructed at different levels, but also how the Chinese actors negotiate and try to take advantage of these global interconnections in order to you know, make their country as strong as possible. And finally, from next year, we'll be teaching a second year class on empires in world history. Um, and the, the framing of this class is thinking about uh, different empires around the world comparatively through different themes that they, in various ways, uh, share in common. So there'll be a series of thematic lectures, and the students will be able to have the choice to do supervisions on uh, two different empires. And so if you're interested in the Qing Empire, you can do a deep dive through a series of four supervisions uh, on different aspects of the Qing Empire, kind of across that history that I just sketched very briefly, but of course you'd have the opportunity to go into much greater depth uh, and kind of much more self-directed uh, reading into different parts of the Qing Empire, such as its expansion into different frontier regions, uh, depending on what interests you. Um, in terms of where to go next, if you're interested in learning more about uh, the Qing Empire and its history, one book that I very much recommend is Stephen Platt's book, Imperial Twilight. I really like that book uh, because there's some really kind of wonderful and engaging narrative in it, of course, um, but also because the timing of the book uh, straddles uh, the, this kind of uh, 18th century, this age of prosperity, and moving into the 19th century, a period of kind of great trouble and turmoil for the Qing dynasty, and it leads up to the First Opium War, and I think, for me, that's a really interesting uh, period of history uh, to be studying as we think about what it might look like for the world, for our world as we know it, to kind of change in really uh, dramatic ways. So um, that's a little bit about the Qing Dynasty, who they were, why I think they mattered, and some uh, opportunities for you to learn more about the Qing, either here at Cambridge uh, or otherwise uh, through your own reading. Thank you very much.